Hey everybody, welcome to Building Enter Guys. On this episode, we're gonna take the battery modules that we just built, install them into the floor of the vehicle to form the battery packs, and then light them up to see what the warp floor actually looks like. One big challenge when building anything with electronics is to hide all these wires. They're everywhere. So when designing the platform, I made sure to leave space all around the battery modules for wire channel holders. So with these wire channel holders, I'm able to hide the wiring for the battery modules and also any wires that need to go from the back of the car to the front. I made sure to put grooves on the top of the wire channel holders. So a snap-on cover can be easily put on to hide the wiring, but also take it off for maintenance. The battery module holders were not only designed to fit together with each other, but also to fit inside the wire channel holders like this, so they can be supported when they're on the edges of the vehicle. I finalized printing all these wire channel holders, and there were a lot of them. Since I really pressed for time, I didn't have a chance to iterate the design like I did for the battery module holders. So there's a lot of rough edges that needed to be cleaned up with that old soldering iron, and sold them into the platform with fasteners along the edges and my favorite glue, and that's Gorilla Glue. Let's talk about battery packs how they're designed and laid out. The cell itself is actually pretty straightforward. But what you can do is you can lay it out in different ways to provide the specifications that you need for your specific use case. There's capacity, that's how many cells you're gonna have in parallel to provide you enough power to drive the vehicle at a certain distance or power your, your light sound systems. And then there's voltage, which is how many you're gonna actually wire in series to provide a certain voltage requirements for either low voltage systems like a 12 volt lighting sound systems to a higher voltage drivetrain. In this example of a low voltage battery pack layout, we have four cells in series. This gives us a voltage of 14.8 with a range of 12 to 17, depending on the state of charge. Now, if we take the exact same low voltage battery pack layout, but increase the cells in parallel to five, we now have an increase in capacity and also discharge and charge rates. In our first example of one cell in parallel, the maximum we could pull from a single cell was 6.8 amps. But now, with five cells in parallel, we can supply 34 amps. Now let's look at a high voltage battery pack example. Here we have 13 cells in series. This provides us the high voltage of 48 volts, but with only one cell in parallel, we are limited to the 6.8 amps that we can pull from a single cell. Just like in the low voltage battery pack, once we added higher counts of cells in parallel, we were able to increase the capacity and discharge rates of the battery pack. So you can see by customizing the number of cells in parallel and series, you can configure your battery pack to meet the needs of your requirements. How big of a battery pack do I really need to have in the R car? Uh, given that Burning Man is about three by three miles with the man in the middle of the playa, and then the outside has the, the camps, and then deep playa is, is kind of like where the farther art installations are. And I wanted to be able to drive the car all the way to deep playa to the man and then back to camp several, several times during the day and not have to worry about the battery pack capacity. So that alone is a few miles of driving. So I want to do that at least five or six times a day, you know, times a few miles, let's say three to four miles. So that's going to be like 10 to 15 miles of range that I want to have the R car to be able to do from the battery packs. And given my calculations where the car can run about kilowatt to go between five or 10 miles per hour, so it's gonna be 15 miles at five miles per hour. So that's gonna be three kilowatt hours of power that I would need to be able to drive 15 miles. And if I'm doing two battery packs, one on the left side, one on the right side, kind of have some redundancy, then that means I could have six kilowatt hours would mean I can drive 30 miles. Now it's finally time to install the battery modules into the floor to form the battery packs. We inserted each battery module into the channel holders with the brass bus bar pushing through. It was a tight fit, but we eventually got them all in. And it was really great to see all these parts coming together. I drilled holes at the end of the bus bars to create terminals. And then I wired together all those terminals of all those battery modules with brass nuts and bolts. I had to be careful not to drop the screwdriver across any of these terminals, because that'd be dangerous and cause like a huge spark. I wouldn't know anything about the huge sparks. So how do we make sure that the battery stays within the safe range? Well, we use something called a battery management controller, and that's what this is. So I ordered a bunch of these from China, Alibaba once again, and these nifty things allow us to make sure to keep the battery pack safe. What it does is you actually connect these pins here, have a wire that goes to the actual cell row. So every single time you have a cell uh, in series, there will be a connection to one of these pins so that it can actually read the voltage of that row in your battery pack. So based on your layout, for example, my layout is 48 volts. So I need 13 times 3.7 volts to get to 48 volts. So 13 means I need to get a battery management controller like this one that handles 13. This one actually handles 16, 
rows, but it's configurable so I can actually just use the 13 off of it. So it'll handle my high voltage battery pack. If it is ever charging above 4.2, so if it reads a voltage of 4.25, then this MOSFET here that actually connects the charger to the battery pack will disconnect. And then basically your charging is done. So when you're actually looking at battery management controller, like this one here, this is how it works. P minus is gonna be your load, C minus is gonna be your charger coming in, and then this is your battery negative that would go to the bottom of the battery pack, basically. And then on the other side, you would have a positive connection of the battery pack, a fuse that would handle in case there's a short somewhere. And then after that, the positive line would then go to the other connections to your, you know, the charger and as well as the, the motor or any kind of where your load is. Now it's time to install the battery management system into each battery pack. At the top, we have two high voltage battery packs. Those are 48 volts, and be used to drive the motor. At the bottom, we have two low voltage battery packs. Those are 12 volts, and can be used for lights and sound systems. So you're probably wondering, hey Chris, are you designing a cooling and heating system for this battery pack? Um, no. The short answer is no. Uh, a lot of cars, uh, EVs have cooling systems, some do not actually, uh, and some have heating systems as well. So the concept here is that this battery will have an optimal temperature range that it'll actually be able to perform. So if it's really, really cold, like let's say your, your EV, like you're, you're actually, you actually own an EV is in you know, freezing temperatures, for example, this battery is actually not gonna perform that well. It's gonna be, have a lot shorter range if it's in a very cold climate. EVs that are destined for cold markets would have you know, a heating pump that would circulate depending on how they're built. There would be a certain part of the battery pack that had like a liquid that would flow next to it and circulate and heat the battery pack so it, it would be operating a certain temperature, an optimal temperature to give you the actual capacity when you're pulling power from it. And then likewise, if you're kind of like in a warm climate or you're really gunning the car, so you're, 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 putting, a, you're putting a lot of load on that battery continuously, uh, that's gonna generate heat in the battery. And that heat needs to be discharged away from the battery because if it ever gets like beyond a certain temperature, then that's dangerous for the battery. It's important that if you're really pulling a lot of power out of the battery continuously, uh, that you have a cooling system on that battery pack. And not all car manufacturers actually are including these in them. So the cheaper the, the EV, the less systems you're gonna get. So that means you're gonna see you know, a less capacity and range when you're in extreme cold or, or extreme heat conditions. Just like when you're gonna take your electric car to a racetrack, you know, if you're gonna do that, you have to make sure your car has a, has a cooling system. So all of the, all the tests of the manufactured cars have cooling mechanism that make sure that, that those batteries stay cool and that they're often in their optimal temperature range, recycling heat or keeping cool so that they, are, they're, they work perfectly. So why am I not doing that? It's because it's very complicated to design a heating and cooling mechanism with liquid and, and pumps and everything for the actual battery packs. You know, if you're designing this for production worthy type of a car or mechanism that has a specific environment, then you need to take that into consideration. So one way to mitigate having to have a cooling or heating system in a battery pack is kind of knowing what operating temperature would work based on your charging and discharging rates. So if you're gonna be like, if you're gonna be charging this thing like really, really fast, they're gonna heat up. So you have to limit the rate of your charging so that they don't heat up as much. Or likewise, when you're discharging them, so you're, you're connected to a motor and you're gonna get in that motor, you're gonna have a certain amperage limit that this battery will ever see so that it'll keep cool. Because a low enough amperage you're gonna be pulling away from this battery, the battery will keep relatively cool, like maybe slightly warm, it will definitely heat up. If you can control that pull, draw current, then you will be able to limit how hot this gets and you won't have to have a, a cooling mechanism. So in my design, I wanted to make sure that I didn't need a cooling system, uh, so I limited the number of amperage I can pull from this battery, and I knew that I put, if I put enough of these in parallel that I would distribute the requirements and be able to handle my specifications for how much amperage I can pull. So I'm gonna put enough of these in parallel that I can draw enough current that I need to sustain my motor when I'm pushing a bunch of people and heavy load in the car to prevent these from getting too hot. This is the big moment that I've been waiting for. It's time to test the warp floor by illuminating those battery modules with LEDs. So by varying the brightness and the colors of the LEDs in the floor, it's gonna really turn up the effect if you're standing on it and maybe dancing. And they look amazing. I want it to look like we're on a spaceship. So when we're standing on the warp floor, I want it to look like a pulsating power source, feeding power to those warp nay cells. I really couldn't be happier on how this came out. If you like this episode, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Also, hit the subscribe and notification buttons to be alerted for new episodes each Thursday. 
On the next episode of Building Enter Guys, we're going to focus the drivetrain. We're going to install the motor, the gear down, the brakes, and the steering. <laughs>